we are ready to go with our final speaker. Um, so <laughs> uh, Manuel and I, our, our paths have over, overlapped quite a few times, but I think this is the first time I've heard him speak in person, <laughs> which I'm very excited about. Um, the best description I have ever heard of Manuel is that he's annoyingly productive. <laughs> which I, I think is accurate. So this is the guy that recently wrote 100 Days of More or Less Modern CSS, um, publishing a new article on modern CSS um, every day, I think, for 100 days, <laughs> um, while also doing his day job and uh, just having had a newborn baby. So <laughs> uh, yes, productive is a good description. Um, but I think it also shows just how passionate he is about the web. Um, and he definitely brings that passion and enthusiasm to everyone everything he does. He has a like, fantastic blog. He does awesome writing about accessibility as well as CSS and HTML. He um, has HTML Hell, a collection, a collection of HTML worst practices and how to fix them. Very, very useful. As well as being you know, an incredible writer in general. He's a fantastic speaker, teacher, workshop leader, web consultant, and HTML and CSS aficionado. So please welcome for our final talk, Manuel. Hello, lovely people, and thank you so much for staying until the very end. I really appreciate it. Uh, before I start, can you please give a big round of applause for the organizers and the whole team, the MCs, of course, and also the previous speakers. We... No. Let me start again. We are Zach Letterman in a frame drinking a beer, and my name is Manuel Matusovic. I'm a front-end developer, consultant, teacher, and accessibility auditor from Austria, and I've been thinking a lot about CSS, and especially about the way I write CSS. Yes, that's how boring I am. But there's a good reason why I've been thinking so much about CSS. Last year in September, I was scrolling through my Twitter timeline, you know, back then when I was still active on uh, Twitter before they uh, banned me for no apparent reason whatsoever. Fuck you very much, Twitter. Um, so before they banned me, I was scrolling from my Twitter timeline, and I was looking at tweets about CSS by people like Bramus van Damme, Miriam Suzanne, Ahmed Shadid, uh, Stephanie Eccles, Michelle Barker, Adam Argyle, Yuna Kravitz, and I was like, what the fuck are they talking about? Um, I experienced something that I usually only have when I see CSS written by Anna Tudor. I didn't understand anything, but uh, it was a bit different because I was looking at the CSS and I was like, I should actually understand that, but uh, I just wasn't familiar with the properties and values and functions they were using because somehow I completely missed out on the new stuff in CSS. Stuff people like the ones you see on screen and others have been writing about for months. So I was looking at their tweets and I was like, what the hell is inset? Uh, why do we need where and is? Do we really need both? Is there a difference? And what in Hakon William Lee's name are cascade layers? And how do you define colors in 2023? Hex, RGB, HSL, HWB, LAB, LCH, OK, LAB, OK, LCH, and fucking magnets, how do they work? <laughs> I had so many questions and I was completely lost. And I decided I had to change something and I had to change it drastically and I had to change it now. I've heard about those 100 days of code challenges where people who start coding uh, code for at least one hour a day and share their, their progress daily for 100 days. And I decided to do my own version of that. And I called it 100 days of more or less modern CSS. Because I decided to write a blog post about more or less modern CSS every day for 100 days. And I did. And wow, was that a horrible experience. At first, it was okay because I'm a smart man. I wrote 13 posts in advance just in case that I might miss a day. But as it turns out, I'm not that good at maths, and also I overestimated my own dedication and motivation. So after 30 days, I had used up all of my credit of pre-written posts, which means that I had to write 70 blog posts about CSS every day for 70 days. 
And I know what you're thinking. You didn't have to. Yes, of course I didn't have to, but after 30 days, I was way too deep into the challenge, and I got ambitious. And also, I didn't want people like fucking Max Berg to make fun at me online just because I uh, missed the day. Love you, Max. Um, anyway, this is how it looks like. 100 posts about more or less modern CSS. Now, while I don't recommend it to do the same thing just for the sake of your well-being, I have to say that I'm really proud, proud about this side project. It's probably one of my best side projects because uh, every post focuses on one thing. It's short, includes interactive demos, has code pens, additional resources, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty, pretty great project. Um, but honestly, it was a lot of work and I did put a lot of pressure on myself. At the same time, I've learned a lot. And you can put the things that I've learned into three categories. The first category is pretty obvious. Like, I learned modern CSS. That was my goal. I recently saw this post by Yuna, Adam, and uh, Bramus called What's New in CSS and UI? And they talk about all the new shiny things in uh, CSS. It's basically a written version of uh, Yuna's uh, talk, you could say. And I went through that, and I was like, Okay, I covered that. That's day 50. That's day 6. That's day 99. Day 68. Day 86. Like, I had most of those things in my series. And I was, I was like, yeah, okay, that's cool. There were just some exceptions, like popover. Uh, Hidde talked about that. Um, or scoping. I think Hayden talked about scoping. I, th I think the talk was about scoping. Um, <coughs> yeah, there were some exceptions. Also, trigonomic functions in CSS, fuck me, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So I learned the obvious stuff, stuff that I wanted to learn, modern CSS. But I also learned stuff that I didn't plan to learn because I didn't know about it. For example, day uh, 75 and day 76, color fonts. There are color, fo color fonts in CSS and also color palettes where you can override colors in those fonts. I didn't know about that. Super awesome stuff. That's the first category of things that I learned. And the second one is I learned CSS basics. I learned about some of the fundamentals of the language that I kind of already knew, but not really. Stuff that I needed to understand properly in order to understand some of the newer stuff. Um, Miriam mentioned uh, in her talk that um, uh, I wrote a post about container style queries and also I created this demo. And I remember writing her because I wrote on, on Mastodon several times. Thanks so much for your support. Um, I wrote her and I said, hey, um, I'm pretending once again to be a smart guy and I'm writing a blog post. And um, I wrote this thing with container style queries and custom properties and it works, but I don't understand why. And of course, within seconds, she replies, yeah, because we're using the computed value. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, that makes so much, so much sense. But in reality, I thought, what the fuck is the computed value? I have no idea what she's talking about. Yeah, I mean, I kind of knew, but not really. So I learned about value processing on day 82. Super interesting stuff. Or here's another one. Uh, who of you knows the difference between inherit, initial, unset, and revert without looking it up? OK, the Google people, yeah, OK. Uh, not too many of you. I didn't either. Uh, but I had to learn that stuff in order to understand how revert layer works in cascade layers. Super interesting stuff. I already forgo forgot how it works, so yeah. Um, or here's another one. Important. I thought that I knew how important works. Uh, I knew how to use it. I knew how, when it applies. But I didn't know how it actually works. And Yuna helped me with that, actually, by creating a video that I watched. It's also in the, in the blog post. It's uh, day 74. And the last thing that I learned, or actually realized, is that some of the things that I wrote about, some of the additions to existing modules and some new modules, will change the way we think about CSS and write CSS significantly. And this is nothing that, that happens for the first time. It happens all the time. It happened several times in the past, and it will happen many times in the future. And before I talk about the past, uh, the, the present and the future, I want to talk about the past real quick. And we will start here. Here's a fo photo of uh, me and my friend Bob. Um, I don't know when that photo was taken because I'm really bad at estimating a kid's age, even if it's myself. So I'm probably like two years old or nine. Or I really don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. The important bit here is that this photo was taken in the 90s. We're sitting in front of a desk, and there's an old-school computer and monitor. And it's not connected to the internet. So we are probably playing a game like Solitaire or this game with this strange Danish goblin called Hugo. 
A couple of years later, I had a new computer. On screen is a photo of my living room. You can see stuff lying around everywhere. Uh, not living room, bedroom. Uh, CDs, cans, and bottles. The case of my computer is open. There's an old school TV and a Sega Dreamcast. And um, this computer was connected to the internet, and I was, a, uh, I was playing a completely different game. And the game was called Counter-Strike 0.1. And oh my god, did I love that game. I played it before school, I played it after school, I played it during school, when I should have been at school. It was just such a fantastic game. And I played it with my friends offline. On screen you can see a photo of my friend's parents' uh, kitchen and uh, living room, and there's a big kitchen table, and there are four monitors, pretty big, and computers. There's 13-year-old me playing the game, and my 13-year-old friend's natural-born killer, the Arnarchist and Dark Headshot Man. <laughs> <laughs> and we're playing the game, we played it offline, we also played it online. We were in a so-called clan. A clan is a group of people who play the game together in tournaments against other people. And as a proper clan, you needed a couple of things. A name, a handle for that name, and a website. Our handle was MTM, and MTM stood for Monster Merde. Now, I'm really sorry for those of you who speak French, but we were 13 years old at that time, and we just started learning French in school. So, of course, the name of our clan had to be Eat Your Poo in French. So, of course, it had to be. And you guessed it, I made the website, and this is how it looks like. Yes, a classic free column layout. Yes, optimized for a resolution of 1024 by 768. Some highly inaccessible um, image buttons. Of course, a marquee tag. There's even some JavaScript in there. And uh, yeah, I made this 23 years ago. I'm pretty proud of it. And of course, I was using frame sets. You learned about them uh, yesterday in Hayden Hayden's talk. Now, what's special about this site, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot special about this site, but what's really special about the, this site in terms of CSS is that I'm using no CSS. For styling, I'm using presentational attributes like text and link and v-link and a-link or color and presentational elements like font and center. And of course, for layout, like I already said, frame sets and frame and of course table and of course the break element <laughs> for layout. So I built a couple of websites that way and uh, yeah, they were great. I, I had a great time. That time was just great. It was just fun to make websites. Now I don't enjoy it that much, but uh, back then it was really great. And I would say that the first time the way I write CSS changed was when I actually started writing CSS. And it looked a little bit like the, this horrible, horrible CSS, like deeply nested selectors with high specificity and also presentational class names and a lot of important because I, was, uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And it, it was horrible. It got a little bit better. Um, thanks to people like uh, Jonathan Snook and his uh, scalable modular architecture for CSS book, but it looked like that for quite a while. The next big milestone for me was in 2010, when Yves Marcot published his iconic article about res responsive web design on a list apart. And now I didn't declare my horrible, horrible CSS once, but multiple times in media queries. <laughs> yes, and of course, at some point, I realized that I had to change something because uh, what I wrote was maintainability and specificity nightmare. Uh, I had to change something. And I was able to change something thanks to people like the amazing Nicole Sullivan and her object-oriented CSS, or thanks to people, um, the people at uh, Yandex who came up with the BAM notation block element. Uh, modifier. So this way, my CSS got much better, much more maintainable and scalable uh, because the specificity was flat, and yeah, that worked quite well for me. And I would say the last big milestone for me was uh, when I started to use preprocessors. First, less than SAS. I never used stylus, I'm not a hipster, um, but I used SAS for quite a while, and uh, yeah, my, my, my CSS looked like that for quite a while. Those are my biggest milestones, um, but since I don't want to make this just about myself, I asked people on uh, Mastodon, Mastodon, Mastodon what their influences were. And here's a summary. Many people mentioned books, like for example, Mobile First by Luke Wroblewski, fantastic book, or Designing with Web Standards by Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Seldman, sorry. And of course, many people mentioned Every Layout by uh, Hadron Pickling and uh, Andy Bell. <laughs> Others mentioned articles like a DAO of web design by John Elsop, 
or many people also mentioned the redesign of the wire.com website when they switch from HTML to CSS, and of course, uh, the fantastic CSS Zen Garden, which recently celebrated its uh, 20th birthday. Yes. Many people also mentioned uh, modules and properties like flexbox or grids or box sizing or aspect ratio. Uh, on screen is a graveyard and there's a gravestone and it says, here lies Cleofix after, rest in peace, 2004 until 2013. If you understand this joke, you are old. <laughs> and of course, many people also mention methodologies like it CSS, IT CSS. I wrote Harry and I asked him how to pronounce it, he didn't reply, so I will just call it it. Um, and of course, Cube CSS by Andy Bell and uh, Atomic Design by Brett Frost. Many people were influenced by stuff that I wasn't influenced at all, like CSS and JS, of course, that changed the way some people write CSS significantly, and also utility-first frameworks or stuff like post-CSS, for example. <coughs> Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to. Um, those were just some uh, examples that people had in common. If there's something missing, if you want to add something, please find me after my talk and tell me about your influences or post them on social media using the CSS Day hashtag. All right. Now, enough for the past. Let's talk about the present and a possible future. And the first thing that I want to talk about are custom properties. Before I began using custom properties, I thought they were just a verbose and ugly replacement for variables in SAS, which of course is nonsense. Once I understood what they can do, they changed everything for me. And this happened slowly, like in the last three years or so, because of the types of projects I was working on and the requirements these pro projects had. And custom properties changed the way I write CSS gradually. At first, I was just using them to store values. For example, I have color A and I have color B, which is a variation of color A. Super simple stuff, and uh, this helped me write much cleaner CSS. Super easy. And then, slowly, I started to put more and more stuff into custom properties. Um, I'm, I'm doing that to enforce systems, systems for spacing and typing, uh, and type and color and, and sizing. And also, I get a little bit smarter with my custom property usage. So instead of just defining color A and color B, I'm defining the parameters of the color function of color A separately, and I'm reusing them in color B and only changing the values that I don't need. Yeah, nothing, nothing too special, but I'm just you know, trying to get more out of custom properties. By the way, this, was, this will get so much easier thanks to the relative color syntax. I think it was mentioned several times. With the relative color syntax, you can just take one color and use its information in any other color function. Like I can define color A as a hex value and then use the information from the color in an HSL function, which is super awesome. You can read about that on day 92. Another influence was an article that my friend, uh, friend Mike Reitmuller, Reitmuller, Mike R wrote. Uh, he wrote about custom properties in 2017 in an article called Using CSS Variables Correctly. And in this article, he said that he considered the code you see here code smell. He didn't like this code. What he doesn't like about that is that in line three, I'm declaring the flex direction property. I'm setting it to column. And then in the media query, in line eight, I'm repeating the property declaration and I'm setting it to row. Now, I wouldn't call this code smell. For me, it would be fine. Like, if, if, if a colleague writes this and I, I have to check it, I would say, yeah, that's cool. But I don't like to do that either. What Mike suggests is that you cre create a custom property for your dynamic values. Dynamic in terms of a value that will change at some point. So you define a custom property for your column value. You use the flex direction property once. And then in the media query, you just change the custom property. You don't re-declare the property. And that way, you get a really nice separation of concerns. In the top part of your component, you have just declarations of custom properties and normal properties. And in the lower part of your component, CSS, you only change custom properties. Of course, uh, instead of declaring an initial value, you could just use the fallback value of the custom property as a default value. So I'm using column here as the fallback value for when flex direction doesn't exist, the custom property. You can do that. I, I've done it in the past, but I find it hard to read, so I'm not doing that anymore. 
here's another powerful way of using custom properties. I'm a big fan of web components, and I could talk about them for uh, another 50 minutes. But we already had a fantastic talk about web components, and there will be another fantastic talk about web components at the CSS Cafe meetup tomorrow uh, by my friend Egor. And um, yeah, uh, so I'm not going to talk much about web components. There's just one thing that I want to show you. I've built a couple of web components for the city of Vienna, like the one you see here. This one is pretty basic. It's just a basic card component. We're using the WM card custom element. WM stands for Wiener Melange, Viennese Melange. Of course, we need a yeah, and in, uh, yeah, an interesting name. It doesn't matter. It's, a ni it's nice. It's, it's a Viennese thing. It does really matter. Yeah, it's super simple. And then we have a heading. We have uh, a div for some content and also an image. And the what you see here, the design that you see here is not the default styling. This is just a variation because we build our components as white label solutions. So they come with some styling, but no branding that is specific to the city of Vienna. So other people can use other people can use them and also provide their own styling. So the version of this component you see here is one that I changed. And I changed it by using a bunch of documented custom properties. And since a bunch of documented custom properties doesn't sell well, we call it CSS API. Uh, I think we stole that term from the Shoelace project. Anyway, uh, here's an example. The, the card component, this is the documentation for the card component. And you can see 10 custom properties. One is called card shadow, one is called card background, card border, and so on. And I can select that and change the styling. So for example, if I wanted to create a CSS day card, I would just select WM card, Wiener Melange card. And then I change some custom properties, like card background, card shadow, card border, and so on. And then I get a variation of this card, where the background is different, the space, the, the padding is different, and the border. A CSS API is an excellent way of providing devs with controlled hooks for manipulating your design. I really like that. It's, um, it, it works well for me. And uh, this way of writing web components also made me give the style attribute some long-deserved love. Because my components have no modifier classes. Uh, they only have attributes and custom properties. So if I wanted to create a variation of uh, my card without a shadow, I would just use the style attribute and set card shadow to none. And why not? It's not like I'm changing an arbitrary property. It's defined in our documentation. It's a documented property. And even if I want to change a color, for example, why not? I have a list of design tokens, and they're also documented, so I can just use that value. It's fine. And I know what you are thinking, or at least some of you. Manuel, we're not supposed to do that. That's a bad practice. Yes, I know. And I was reluctant uh, at first, too, but I thought a lot about the, the style attribute and about uh, good and bad practices in general. And my conclusion is, and I know I'm not the first one to say that, but I think it's time to break with certain conventions and re-evaluate what's a good and what's a bad practice. The things that you've heard at this conference aren't just additions to the language that you add to your tool belt. Some of them have the potential to change the way we think and write CSS, think about and write CSS. That language is changing rapidly. You all know that, and it's, and it's changing radically, and we must adapt to it. And in terms of custom properties, this means not just using them at, as dumb variables, but trying to get the most out of them. And again, I'm not the first one to say that. Leah Veru said that last year in her presentation about custom properties, which obviously was an inspiration for my talk. And, and in her talk, she showed you this graph, or actually the version from the previous year of this graph. It's from the um, HTTP archive web almanac, and they tested a lots of lots of sites, and they analyzed the custom properties. And what this graph shows is that, like the years before, the vast majority of properties test on tested site, sites had a depth of zero, meaning that they did not include the values of other custom properties, but just you know static values. The depth of one increased slightly, and the depth of two decreased slightly. And this indicates that our usage of custom properties is staying the same in terms of complexity. We are primarily using them to st store simple values. Returning to my previous example. Now, if we take my card component and I uh, tweak it and use the style attribute, then for me, this, this code now starts to smell because there are too many things in, in this attribute. I know that some of you love to put as much stuff as possible into attributes. But um, yeah, for me, I, I don't like that. So what, what, you, what I can do or what you can do is to just you know, create a class and then use the class to change your custom, custom properties. This works. Why not? I've done it in the past. Or you could just create a custom 
custom property, like with a custom name and custom value. For example, you could call it card style CSS day. And then in your CSS, you use a container style query and you say, when a card style CSS day is present, please apply those properties. Let me give you another example. Um, Here's a simple block quote component, and um, there's a diff, and in a diff there's a block quote, and here it says, underline your fucking links with sociopaths um, by Hayden Pickering, a quote by Hayden Pickering. And this is how it looks like. The text is a little bit larger than the rest of the text, and also the author is um, in italics. Fine. Now, if I wanted to create a variation of this component that looks a little bit different, I would just use the style attributes again. Take the photo. No pressure, we have time. <laughs> I would just use the style attribute and uh, use my, again, custom quotes type, custom property, and change the value to highlight, and then in my CSS, I query that, and then I get a different design. The type is a little bit larger, the quotes look a bit different. Okay, how is that better than a class name? It's just more CSS, you can do that with classes. Well, inheritance. Now, imagine you have a an article, and in this article you have a bunch of quotes, not just one, and you want to st change the styling of all of the quotes. We have the quotes, the quote, previous quote that I showed you, and another uh, Pickering classic, which is, you looked like a crab having a sad wank. <laughs> oh, okay. But now I'm wondering whether the, the crab you were ref referring here to is one of those boxer crabs with the jellyfish <laughs> gloves, because this gives the quote a really dark twist. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, so let's say we have a <laughs> multiple block quotes and we want to change the styling of all of them. We could, of course, just put a class on each block quote or we put it on the parent element, on the parent article. And now all the block quote components will inherit this custom property and change their styling according. And if you have 10 block quotes and you want one to look differently, then you could just put the style attribute on this specific and use a different value, you know, CSS. Awesome. So the article could look something like this, or if you, if you have a third style, like this pull quote thing, where you also change the layout a little bit, you can do that all in one place, only in CSS, without touching HTML. That was a strange break. Um, for me, this is one of the most exciting things in CSS. You can take that idea and develop it further. Imagine writing components and providing those who use use those components with API endpoints that don't just allow them to tweak the styling like we saw it with the card component, but that enable them to configure the layout, the style, and the theme of components, sections, and whole pages directly in CSS and in CSS only. And Adam Wave and hates this trick because this means fewer classes. Not that... <laughs> Not that, yeah, no more Tailwind today. Uh, not that classes are bad, but we're reducing the dependency of the class as a middleman between our markup and our CSS. What you see here is a very, very early draft of the redesign of my website. It will probably be finished in like 10 years or so. Um, every component you see on this page is in its default state. So every component has a default styling, and then it has different variations that I can use across the page. So in my header on the left, you can see the main uh, the navigation. Then I have a paragraph in the main element. There are some upcoming events, some recent blog posts, and selected blog posts and stuff like that. And if I now wanted to change the styling of this page, I wouldn't go into my HTML file or nunchucks or whatever. Because my markup only has a couple of classes. It's mostly just HTML elements. Um, if we use the BAM rhetoric, then you would say there are only blocks, almost no elements, and no modifiers. So if I wanted to change the styling of this specific page or of parts of this page, I would just open my config.css file, and then I would select the header, for example, and set the main, uh, the um, nav style custom property to main, or I would set the paragraph style property to initial letter. Or um, if I wanted the teasers to look differently, I would set card style to small, or card style to events, or card style to large. If I wanted to reset a list, I would just say list reset. That's way too small, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm using CSS to configure the layout of my page, and I'm doing it in CSS, I'm not touching the markup. And that's pretty cool, right? And also if I wanted to change uh, the theme, I could just set 
theme to dark on the root element, and it just applies. And another advantage of that approach is that you can decouple variations of components from their media queries. And what I mean by that, usually when you work mobile first, and I guess most of you do, you write your default styles for mobile, and then you have a media query, and in, in that media query you have some variations of your component. Nothing special about that. We've been doing that uh, since 13 years. But what if you wanted to take this styling and use it somewhere else with no condition? What if you wanted to extract those styles and use them separately? You would either have to repeat yourself or you, need, you would need something like a mix-in uh, in SAS, but we don't have mixins yet in CSS. So this is how my cards or teasers look by default. And um, on larger viewports or larger containers, uh, the thumbnail, the size of the thumbnail increases, and I'm showing content. Now, how can I? What can I do in order to use this in the media query, but also extract extract those styles and use them separately? Well, the first of is I repeat what I did earlier. I just write my base styling, my default styling, and then I put the variation not in a media query, but in a container style query. So I query the card style large property. I make my variations, and now in order to make it responsive. I write the media query again, and now I don't repeat those properties. I just set card style to large. OK, that's a bit more CSS. But the advantage here is if I wanted a card large with no conditions, I just set card style large on that class. And that's really cool. I like that. Yes, uh, just for the sake of completeness, of course, you can also change and get custom property values in. Uh, CSS, um, in JavaScript using the set property and get property value methods. Custom properties are amazing and I believe they're getting even more amazing thanks to container style queries and uh, yeah, take, take full advantage of what they can do and uh, maybe even break with some conventions. Speaking about uh, breaking with conventions, um, I've read the following sentence in an article by Miriam Suzanne that was part of Stephanie Eccles' 12 Days of Code. She wrote, Layer, layers help us reclaim the declarative control of the intent behind our CSS without removing helpful information about the specificity of selectors. We're managing the cascade instead of removing it. I read that and was like, hmm. So I kept reading. And she wrote, selectors are there for a reason, and we should take advantage of their full potential. Instead, we've been restricting what selectors are allowed and enforcing more and more limited conventions in an attempt to somehow avoid the cascade. But the cascade is unavoidable. It's the core of the language, and this is where she got me. Like, I was all fired up. I was ready to burn a building or overthrow a government when I read that. There will always be selector conflicts, and there will always be an algorithm to resolve those conflicts. All we've been doing is denying ourselves access to one of the coolest features on the web platform. And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, it's true. And she also gives examples. Uh, in the article, she says, this selector, like dot .contact, and then in square brackets, type equals submit, and uh, submit in its focus visible state, tells a much better story than the same thing in the BAM notation it does a better job of showing the intent behind the selector. And I absolutely agree, but we've been doing that 20 years ago, and we realized that it's not a smart thing. It doesn't really work well. It doesn't scale well. Um, so how can we do that again without handing in, uh, ending in maintainability and specificity hell? Miriam says maybe we're using cascade layers. I'm not going to explain in detail how they work. Stephanie already talked about them. Um, that's not what we're here for, but basically, the cascade layers allow you to scope the specificity of selectors to a specific layer, and a layer defined later in a document overrides uh, the specificity or overrides a layer defined earlier. So, on a high level, cascade layers solve a problem for me. Like, I can understand how cascade layers can help us with uh, complex selectors. So, in my base selector, I can do whatever I want. In my component selector, the selector will always override the base. Uh, the, the selector defined in the base layer because it's defined later in the document. Except when you use important, like I said, I don't know how important works in cascade layers, so I'm not going to do that. Okay, so on a high level, I get it. It works. Makes absolute sense. But on a component level, I still see some problems. Let's say we have a card, and in the card we have a border, and I'm saying uh, when the card has an image with the loading attribute set to lazy, fantastic selector, by the way, uh, when we have something like that, then the color, the color of the border should be red. That's fine. 
But let's say we have a variation called card large, and I always want the images in large cards to be blue, no matter um, if they have a, a loading attribute or not. This wouldn't work, because in order to make this work, I would either have to use a selector with the same specificity or higher specificity. So I would just repeat that, use loading lazy, um, the, the attribute selector, but I don't like that. I could use important, but again, I don't know how it works, so I'm not going to do that. I could use where to decrease the specificity of the original selector, but I don't know, I really don't want to do that. What we can do is we can nest layers. That's possible. You can nest multiple layers uh, in each other. So I could create a default layer and put my default styles in there. And now the big advantage is that if I put variations directly into the components layer, so if they're unlayered within the components layer, they will automatically overwrite the specificity of the selectors in the default layer because unlayered styles have precedence over layered styles. If you find that confusing, you can just create another layer. You could say, okay, I have a default layer and I have a large layer. Why not? It's, uh, like the, it's more readable, I would say. And I can see that working. Like, of course, I haven't tried it on a production website because support isn't great yet. And um, yeah, uh, I didn't have the chance yet. But um, I'm redesigning my website and I'm doing that on my website. Like all the things that I'm talking about today, I'm going to do it, do it on my website and I will see if I fail or not. And of course, the code will be on GitHub, so you can check it out. Putting all this together, um, what has changed about the way I write CSS? I don't really need SUS anymore because CSS solves most of the problems that I had. I went from BAM, from the block element modifier notation, to BAPI or BAPI, BAPI, block and API. It doesn't exist. Don't Google it. I made it up. Um, but maybe it will become a thing. Who knows? So I went from BAM to BAPI, BAPI. I don't know right now. Uh, <laughs> because Cascade layers el eliminate the need to flatten specificity for me and also custom properties with container style queries eliminate the need for modifiers. I spend more time in CSS because I write less classes. Again, I'm not saying that classes are a bad thing, but it's just I mean, in interesting to think about it that you sp can spend more time in your CSS and have a much cleaner separation of concerns. I embrace the cascade, and I don't just declare properties anymore like I used to uh, for many years, but now I declare custom properties, I have some declarations of properties, and I also configure my CSS. Mm. This talk started really light, you know, some photos, history lesson, some jokes, and then it got really technical and dry. So here's a random photo of me dressed as a Norwegian roller skater. <laughs> I'm lying sideways. You can see one leg pointing up. I'm wearing, wearing roller skates, a blonde wig, uh, lipstick, and there's a star painted on one of my eyes. And modern CSS also changed the way I write JavaScript, or actually <laughs> the amount of JavaScript that I write. Because thanks to modern CSS, I write less and less JavaScript. Here's an example. An issue that all of you have encountered is that you try to use 100VH on mobile, and uh, it didn't work the way you would expect it. Yuna mentioned that, and also some others. And the problem is that there are different viewport heights. There's a small viewport where, where all the user interface elements of the browser are visible, or the, the browser Chrome. Then there is the large viewport, where most of, this, of it is not visible. And 100VH will always match the large viewport, no matter if you see the small viewport or the large viewport. And I've used this workaround. So uh, in JavaScript, I would use window.inner heights multiplied by 0 0.01 and use that value in a custom property and then use that instead of the VH unit. And that works. I've, I've done it multiple times. Uh, it's a hack. I don't like it anymore. I'm now using 100DVH, one of the new viewport units. You can read about that on day 38 in VH, SVH, LVH, and DVH. Do you know what sucks when you're on a long page and you switch to a shorter page and you can see the layout flickering? Mac users probably don't know what I'm talking about, um, but Windows users know and those who have changed their default settings. The thing is, when you switch from a long page to a shorter page, the scroll bar takes up some space and the layout might uh, flicker. I've used horrible, horrible hacks in CSS, uh, in JavaScript for that. Now you can use the scroll bar gutter property and set it to stable, and that's it. Now the browser will account for the scroll bar automatically. Now you can see me switching from a long page to a short page, and there's no flickering. 
that's really cool. Uh, you can read about that on day 20 and day 25. Five. You know how for years we've been trying to recreate this amazing Pinterest look? Uh, the really, really important layout, and we forced 24 kilobytes of JavaScript on people just to get that look? Yeah, forget about that. All we need now is the masonry keywords for the grid template rows property, and maybe to improve the accessibility, the masonry auto flow property, and that's it. Five lines of CSS, no JavaScript, and you get masonry. You can read about that on day 71 and day 72. Another feature is has, and has is amazing. We've heard, heard a, lot, a lot about uh, this pseudo class, and here's uh, an example how it reduces the amount of JavaScript that I have to write. Here's a button. I click the button. You can see a modal window pop up. I'm scrolling in the modal window, and as I'm reaching the end of the content in the modal window, the rest of the page scrolls with the content in the modal window, and I don't want that. Instead of using JavaScript, I can just say, select the HTML element, and if it has a dialog with the open attribute, another fantastic selector, if you ask me, then just clip overflow. Now, if I click the button, modal pops up, I'm scrolling, I keep scrolling, nothing happens. Fantastic. I learned that in a post by my very talented friend, uh, Kilian Valkov. It's called Building a Lightbox with the Dialog Element, and it's uh, on the Polypane blog. And here's the last one for today. Um, how would you create something like that? So I'm hovering an element, and you can see it scale up. And as I'm hovering this element, the preceding and the following elements also scale with the element just a little less, depending on the distance to the active element. I can't believe that I nailed that sentence. Um, I had to build that for assignments in ActionScript and Flash. That wasn't too hard. Uh, I could probably also do it in JavaScript, but in CSS. Yeah, now it's relatively easy. I mean, it's super hacky, but uh, you can use has because has is more than just a parent element selector. It's also a previous and next element sibling selector. So yeah, that works. All right, um, we are less and less dependent on JavaScript, which is a great thing, but please note that JavaScript is not the enemy. I like JavaScript, and uh, JavaScript helps me create accessible experiences. So I'm using JavaScript uh, and ARIA to make interactive components accessible. So CSS-only solutions are nice, but they're not always accessible and uh, the better solution. You can read about that in CSS-only widgets are inaccessible by Adrian Rosselli, and when CSS isn't enough by Stephanie Eccles. All right, let's finish this. Um, for me, the way I write CSS has changed significantly, especially in the last three years. And um, most importantly, due to my extensive usage of uh, custom properties. And I believe it will change even more thanks to container style queries. Um, am I recommending that you do all the things that I mentioned today? No, I, I don't care Let me, if you want to do whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, do we think that everyone will start writing CSS the way I just showed you today? No, I don't know, we will see. It, it really doesn't matter. The most important thing to take away from uh, this talk is that the language we also love is growing rapidly and we should grow with the language and reevaluate some conventions and maybe even break some of them. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Manuel. And I'm really pleased to see some lobster in yes, your course. Yes, of course. <laughs> well, I was hoping we'd get to that. <laughs> I'm so disappointed by Amsterdam. I'm here for three days, and there's so many bars and, and uh, billboards, and uh, I haven't spotted a single lobster font in Amsterdam. Oh, no. I'm it's impressed and question. disappointed at the same time. <laughs> well, we have to find the new lobster next. <laughs> um, so we just have time for a couple of quick questions, mm -hmm. um, but then uh, Manuel will also be uh, upstairs at the help desk, I believe, um, at the end. Uh, so the first question is, um, where did you, this is from Stephanie, um, where did you find the CSS that you wanted to learn for the challenge? Um, as you mentioned, um, you learned something that you, you weren't aware of, and do you have a favorite feature from the challenge? Um, 
like I said, I was just scrolling from a timeline, and whenever I saw something that I didn't recognize, I just wrote it down. Uh, whenever uh, I got uh, like I have several newsletters that I follow, and also uh, RSS feeds, uh, and whenever I saw something that I didn't recognize, I didn't know, I just wrote it down, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much how I collected all the things. So I probably had, I would say, about 50 topics. I prepared 50 topics, just the title. So every time I found something, I just wrote day one, um, I don't know, container style queries. Day two, cascade layers. And then I expanded that uh, while I was writing. And uh, if you're wondering right now, I'm at day 113. So yeah, I will add more articles. But in no specific time frame. So <laughs> just keep adding stuff as I'm learning it because there are so many new things that I don't understand yet. Yeah, and um, what's my favorite uh, feature? Definitely the container style queries. This is the most exciting thing for, thing for me. Uh, we were at the pub yesterday and we talked about CSS nerds, you know. And um, I realized that container style queries are actually mixings in CSS, just with the exception, exception that you can't pass parameters. But uh, yeah, that's super exciting and uh, I'm really waiting for you all to start experimenting and, and, and uh, yeah, trying to learn where we can take this, these new things. Very cool. I need to try those out as well. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain the namespacing and the custom properties. I noticed that uh, you may have mentioned it, but I don't r remember that you did. So, um, there was an underscore in your custom property names. Um, was there a reason for that? Yes. Uh, so, like I said, we have the CSS API, so we are opening some properties to the public. So, whenever you see dash dash, this means, okay, you can use this component and change it. And uh, in our CSS internally, we're using dash dash underscore to mark private custom properties that we're just using internally. So we don't want you to use those properties. We're not exposing them to the outside, so they're not documented. And also, when I look at the code, I can see, OK, this is a private one. I mean, it's not really private. It's just mm -hmm. yeah, a convention. I don't know. Uh, where do you steal that? Either Possibly Yuna or Leah. Leah. Yeah, I feel Leah like probably. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm stealing all the things. I'm not smart. <laughs> But pr presumably, you can't actually stop somebody using those properties. No, is it a no, convention? Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can just, you know, use the style attribute yeah. and set background to mm. uh, any yeah. color or whatever. <laughs> Display none. Um, well, thank you very much. That's all we've got time for. But um, okay, please cool. um, give another big hand for Manuel. Thank you. <laughs>